We're in your presence, God. So we lift our expectation. We lift our faith to the size of our God. God, there is nothing impossible with you. So today we're expecting the miracle. I don't know what your the miracle is, but God, today... I'm expecting the miracle that it can happen now. So ready my heart, God. Ready my mind to encounter you, to, to receive from you, to, to hear from you, God. Let it just not be a wasted day, a wasted experience, just another attended Sunday in the books. God, meet us here. Give us a miracle now. Come on, if you receive that, give God some praise one more time. Now, Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, turn to your neighbor and tell him, I'm ready for a miracle. Come on, speak that. Go to your neighbor. Turn to your neighbor. I'm ready for a miracle. Yeah. Go ahead and take your seats. I hope you're ready. <laughs> I hope you're ready for God to move, for God to speak. I hope that's the level of expectation you bring into the house of God today. Because we're in this series called Breakthrough. And Breakthrough is all about God changing God, touching God, just bringing miraculous need and provision into our life, man. And we're in the fourth installment in this breakthrough series. And what we've, what we've talked about, if you miss any of them, you check it out online. But what we've talked about in breakthrough is that we're believing God and we're seeking like hard after God. Uh, we're believing God that he's going to bring discovery. This is what breakthrough means. It's, a, it's an important discovery, development, or advance. And so we're praying for that, believing God that he's going to bring revelation into our life, that as we seek him, He's going to open up your mind. He's going to open up your eyes that you'll see things differently. You'll know things differently because of a breakthrough in the area of revelation. We're praying for a development breakthrough that God does something inside of us and he changes us internally like he develops us. And, and then this last one, we're praying for an advancement breakthrough where God wants to take you to a whole new territory, a whole new level of your faith, just a, just a, new, just a new level of walking with God. We're believing for breakthroughs in this season. And today, actually, it, it lands on the last kind of, today's the last day of our 21 days of prayer and fasting. Can I get an amen? Come on. Okay. So, uh, but although the prayer and fasting is over, the series isn't over. Really, when I was, before this, we started the series and I was in prayer seeking God, God gave me two more kind of messages. He really deposited two more words inside of me that I really wanted us to study through in this breakthrough series. So this will go all the way to our anniversary service, which is in a couple of weeks. And excited about these next two. But honestly, today, today's message is the, it was the revelation I received to birth breakthrough, to, to birth the season, to birth the rest of the messages and that we've been talking about. All the six keys of your breakthrough is what we're going over. And what I'm talking about today is like, it was the initial revelation that everything was kind of surrounded around. So what I believe, I honestly believe that today, that, that this is your breakthrough day. I believe for, for, very, for a lot of you that today is your breakthrough, like, like it's, it's here, it's available. And this is what I'm calling today's message, the fourth key to your breakthrough, and that is the power of peace. The power of peace. That God has this, that, that, that peace, actually, like to have the peace of God can actually promote and invite breakthrough into your life. I want to talk to you about this. This is, this is so awesome. I hope, you, hope you're ready to receive some revelation from God today. Go with me to John chapter 14, verse 27. Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. It's a gift. And he says, I don't give it to you like the world does. This ain't the peace that the world has. It doesn't come from the world. The world doesn't, this is not of the world. So do not let your hearts, look at this, don't let your hearts, Jesus said, be troubled and do not be afraid. See, Jesus is saying, look, I got this gift for you. I came for this. I came to give you this. I got this peace for you, but make sure, you, you, make sure you, that, 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 that fear doesn't pollute your heart, that, that trouble and the, and, the, and the cares of this world don't, don't kind of rest on your heart because I came to give you peace. In the world, there's not a lot of it, but, but I came, and it's a gift for you, but make sure, please, Jesus say, make sure that you don't, you, don't, you don't let your heart get burdened down by trouble and by fear. So let me ask you a question. Where do we lose our peace? Where do you lose your peace? Why aren't we, like all the time, peaceful people? Why aren't we peaceful at all the time? 
at all times. I mean, can I give you my answer that I think is like most of our answers most of the time when we're losing peace? People. people right? People. Let's just, let's just be honest. I love people. I'm a pastor. I love people. But, but I know more than, more than most that people are a problem. Okay? So you're, they're, they are. They're honest. No, because you can be in a presence of God like this. Let's be honest. You're a problem, okay? You can be, you're someone else's problem. You're thinking about other people like, yeah, uh, they are. You're someone else's problem. Come on now. So, but you can be in the presence of God here on Sunday, and I'm encountering God, like truly, and God is working, and miracles, and freedom, and hearing from God, and you're just like, yes, a miracle can happen now, and you receive stuff, and some of you aren't going to last one hour out there, one hour, and, you're, and, and your peace is robbed, it's just taken from you, from total strangers are robbing your peace, some of you are going to yell at the car, you know, some traffic, or the waiter, the waitress, just, are, you know, or some of you, it's going to be your spouse, maybe, that kind of, it just robs you, or your kids. You go home, and you look at the living room, and you go, I thought I told you, monsters. <laughs> what I tell you, you know what I'm saying? Some of you think I'm reading your mail. I know what's going on. Come on now. It's just, it, you guys, it's people, because we could be in here, and it could be just, oh, yeah. And we go out there, and it's like, wow, like, we went from hallelujah to just all out upset, frustrated um, at people. At people, but I know you guys know what I'm talking about uh, with this and what we're going to look at today and what Jesus is telling us, I believe, today. And my job is to try to communicate to you the truths of God and what God really has for you, like today, the, the rhema, the word that God has. And here's what I, I believe God wants you to hear today is do not be troubled. Do not be afraid. There is peace in the midst of the storm. There, there is peace in the middle of your need, in the middle of your challenge, in the middle of your trial. For some of you, this is the breakthrough. Like the peace in itself is your breakthrough. I want to show you this important scripture for this message to set it up. Um, James chapter 3. Look, look at this verse. It's huge. It kind of slams us all a little bit though. This message is going to slam us all. Just get ready, okay? James chapter 3. He says, if you harbor, and the key, that's a key word there, like if you hold on to, is what that means. If you harbor, if you hold on to bitterness and envy and in selfish ambition, it's going to go somewhere. It's going to go to your heart. Okay, if you, if you hold on to that, if you hold on to that, the bitterness, if you hold on to that, 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 that selfish ambition, it's, it's going to rest. It's going to attach itself to your heart. When you harbor it, it, doesn't, it's, it, it, it gets stuck somewhere. Look at what it says. Don't boast about it. Like, it's the right thing to do. Like, like you don't know, Pastor, what they did. They, no, no, seriously, they're wrong. They're wrong. And if, you, if I could tell you my story, you, they're wrong for how they treated me. Trust me, I'm not wrong. They're wrong. I didn't do this. Don't boast about it. Or look at this. He says, or deny the truth. I'm going to give you some truth today. And this truth has the power to bring breakthrough into your life. But there's going to be some of you. I hope it's not, but inevitably there, there is. There's going to be some of you that are going to hear the word today, and you're going to walk out saying, I, I, don't, I can't do that. And I hope it's not you. I hope, that, I hope it's not you. I hope today you receive the word of God. But literally what you're doing when you say that, when you say, I can't, I can't do that, you are keeping yourself from breakthrough by denying the truth. He says, such wisdom... He calls it that because you think you're right. Such wisdom doesn't come down from heaven. Instead, it is earthly wisdom. And by the way, there's a common knowledge out there in America and in our world that we think it's the right way to treat people when they treat us certain ways. We even call it a right. It's my right. I got a right to be angry. I got a right to be mad. I got a right to yell at you. I can spit in your face. I got a right to protest against you. I can march against you. You can march against me. I can get all up in your face face and spit in your face because it's my right all of it is unspiritual and of the devil all of it is it's all wrong it's all coming from the wrong spirit he's saying for where you have check this out this is important for wherever you have that bitterness wherever you have that envy that selfish ambition he said and by the way the selfish ambition is is that word there, he's actually making a connection to earlier in James chapter 1. You should read James. James says, what causes all these quarrels and fights among you? Isn't it your own selfish desires that, desires that war within you? 
So he's making a connection here like, man, you, when you're all bitter and you're just, you're, you're envious and you're, and he uses this word selfish ambition. Some of your Bibles translate that strife. The word there means, it means contention, quarrels, fraction. It's an unsettled uh, spirit is what he's saying. So he's saying, wherever you have that, wherever, wherever you have this envious, bitter spirit, wherever you have unsettled, contentious, quarrelsome, there you will attract into your life disorder and every evil practice. You see, the condition of your soul is attracting chaos. It's attracting disorder, bad habits, even bad people. And some of you even wrestle with the why in this area. Why does this keep happening to me? Why do I always mess up like this? Why do these habits keep, I thought I got them, but these evil practices keep coming back up? Why is it that I can't, and why is my life so hectic and chaotic, and and why is it in such disorder? Some of you are attracted to the wrong people, and this is the reason why. Why is it all, why is it that I always fall for the wrong, why is it they always kind of, those wrong relationships always go to me, and your friends tell you he's no good for you. Your friends tell you she's no good for you, like that's not the, and the condition of your soul Listen, the condition of your soul is attracting disorder. It's attracting evil habits. It's attracting the wrong relationship. But here's what I want you to receive today. Write this down. Peace is the condition of your soul that attracts breakthrough. I hope someone receives that revelation today. That peace is the condition of your soul that invites things, it attracts the right things. into It attracts order and righteousness and blessing and favor. A heart at peace attracts breakthrough. You know, King David wrote a whole entire psalm about how he felt, about how mean people were, about how difficult, you know, people can be robbing him of his peace. It's in Psalm 120, the entire psalm. It's very short. But he starts off this psalm by saying, I'm in distress. He starts off, I'm in distress. I mean, I'm just messed up. I'm upset. And he goes on in verse 6. He says, too long, God, I've lived among those who hate peace. Here he said, "I'm I'm a man of peace. But when I speak, they are for war. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like you live among coworkers? Come on, somebody who, who uh, just don't want any peace, who they, they're, they're always stirring up stuff. How many, how many of you feel like, like you live amongst family members who are always finding something to stir up, to argue about, to, to get upset about? I live in a nation that is just insists on fighting about everything. They don't get anything done in Washington. They don't get anything done in government because they're too busy fighting each other. We live in nations, amongst nations that are constantly at war. And here I am, David says, I'm a man at peace. And it makes it almost unbearable to live in this world that hates peace. They hate it. Now, what what you would like and what you would probably like for me to do today is to help you like give you a message on conflict resolution. How do we resolve that? That's not where I'm going today, okay? We're not going to figure out how to resolve the conflict. Um, not today, because there's some tools. There's some abilities and skills that you can get from God's word, really. And there's a time and place for that, to reconcile the war between two parties and to get them to kind of just get along. That's not today. For today, I'm going to assume we never get along, okay? They're just going to make an assumption, which is true. We never get along. People don't get along generally. You look at recorded history, all of recorded history, the last 3,000 years, there has been on average four wars a year, most of them lasting over one year long. So the question is, can we have peace anyway? Like even, even if the world doesn't change and it continues to hate peace, continue to be at war, even if my co-workers get meaner, Even if my boss starts demanding more, even if my family just gets more retarded, okay? (laughs) Can I still, can can I still have peace? The answer is yes. God has a peace that is available to you that surpasses all of your understanding. 
That's available for you today. In 1945, the UN was formed, and one of their goals was to um, promote peace for all succeeding generations. (laughs) Talk about failing miserably, right? There has hardly been peace since then. God bless them for trying, but someone said peace is that glorious moment in history where everybody stops fighting to reload, right? That's that's just the world we live in, you guys. That's it. So what do you do about all that? Let me show you the progression of conflict. I I always like to show you the progression of things because I'm I'm hoping that you can identify it, that you can can see it, and then you can prevent it from getting worse, prevent, prevent it from operating and getting further in your life. So let me show you the progression. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to see if you can see your soul, the condition of your soul being in any one of these, these areas. Because, okay, so let me give it to you. Progre- uh, the progression of conflict, it always starts. Conflict will always start with this first thing called, I'm calling distance. Distance. A distance of thought, a distance of ideas, a separation of some sort. Marriages happen. When conflict happens, happens in marriage, this is what happens first. There's a distance in it where we just kind of distance, not, not physically, not geographically, but a distance of thought. I just think, th- we just don't think the same. We just don't have the same desires, the same wants. It's a distance of attitude. It's a distance of, uh, distance of thought. It's a distance of belief sometimes where we just kind of allow some distance. And when distance isn't dealt with, and few people ever deal with it, we all like to put up some protective mechanisms, to help us, to make sure that that person never abuses us, never misuses us, never mistreats us ever again. So the second phase after distance is write it down, walls. Walls. Some of you are here today and you have built walls around your heart. You said, no one will ever treat me like that again. No one will ever break my heart. I'm not going to allow anyone to ever do that to me again. So we build what we think is a healthy, protective mechanism to keep us insulated from that person or from that problem ever happening again. But I need to tell you something. Walls have never healed anybody. Walls don't heal. And some, some of you, listen to this, some of you have walls between you and God. So because you, you thought, God, you're supposed to respond this way. You didn't, you didn't do what you were supposed to do. So I can't trust, I can't trust you, God. I'm not going to trust. And so you've built up a wall between you and God. And walls, if not dealt, dealt with, always goes to the third phase, which is escalation. Escalation, meaning the simple problem, and by the way, usually they are, most of our problems, they start simple, okay? They're, it's a simple problem, becomes bigger than it actually is. And we deal with this all the time. People, the people that are actually in it, they can't see it that way, though. It's hard for them because they've already, they've already escalated it. They've already made it bigger than it is. But it always amazes me. Man, sometimes where I have to get involved in something or another pastor has to get involved in some sort of conflict, and it's like, really? That's what you're fighting about? This is what is robbing you of your peace, of your marriage, of your joy? Like, most problems, they start so, so small. But here's the danger. I think this is the danger point. At this phase of your conflict is where it gets really dangerous because when you have this escalation, obviously, then you're now making something bigger than it actually is, which means you've believed a lie, which is the lies are the primary weapon of Satan, which means that you've bought in to some of Satan's lies, which so if it's not dealt with, if it just continues to escalate, it goes to this next phase, which is false belief. And this is the scary one. This really is. This one is very concerning for me as a pastor because a lot of people who are trying to help, they literally cannot see it. They cannot. They've bought into a different reality. They're seeing it from a different perspective, not from God's point of view anymore. And, And they even bring scripture into their defense of why they can treat that person the way that they can treat him and why they can hate them and not like that group or that person or that. I've even heard some people talk about marriage this way. Well, well, they, that's not the person that God had for me. No, no, no. And they, they, well, this is the circumstance that kind of, and we made the wrong decision. We got married, but my soulmate's out there still. And they bought into some, they bought into a lie. They, they bought into a lie. And some of you you're here maybe have buying into a lie. It's that, it's that idea of the grass is greener on the other side. And it never, it never is. 
And I like to say, if it is, it's because the water bill is higher. The grass is greener wherever you water it, okay? All right? So it's not, good. It's not going to be any better over there. You know why? Because you're going to go over there and you're going to find you. If you never really dealt with the problem, you're going to go, you're going to go into another relationship, get into another relationship, and it's going to show up again because you never dealt with your heart. So you move your careers, you move your jobs because of the problem, and you don't deal with the heart, and it shows up again. You move, you, you move relationships, you get into another friendships, or, or maybe another church, is, and I'm not going to deal with my heart, but let me try out another church, and you're, I promise you, this church is pretty awesome, but give us some time, you're gonna, there's going to be something for you to get mad at. You, you, another group, another team, maybe another team, I'll try out this team now, but there you are. It never helps, never solves the problem, because we believe a lie. You don't solve Anything in your heart, it's false belief. False belief then produces this next phase, which is hostility. Hostility, where now I'm upset. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm mad. Here's the interesting thing about hostility. You need to catch this, you guys. This is so huge. Hostility is not the emotion that you feel towards the other person. Hostility is the condition of your soul. All right, are you hearing me today, church? Okay. Um. That is so huge because now literally that person that you thought you were punishing by staying away, by thinking bad thoughts about that person, and you're just thinking all these bad thoughts, and you think you're punishing them, that, that, that situation is robbing your peace. And a lot of times, you're not even at peace with God. Hostility on the inside. So you're here today. Some of you are here today, and you are hostile. You, you, just, you are hostile on the inside. And the way I would kind of help you discover that is to ask yourself this question. Are you at peace with your soul? Are you at peace with your soul? Or is your soul at rest? See, a lot of us is not. And, and, and David prayed another psalm. It's not your, in your notes or anything, but he said, he was speaking to his own soul. He said, why are you so disturbed, oh, my soul? Like he's kind of arguing with himself. He said, soul, put your hope in God. In other words, David knew better. He knew what he should do, but he couldn't because he, his soul had become so disturbed. Could it be that today you're disturbed inside? Your, your hostility on the inside? If so, you're going to find out today that God's word has the power to heal you and set you free. Like you don't, you, you don't have to leave here the same way you came in. There is a gift that is available to you. But finally, like if, again, here's the last phase of this whole progression of conflict. It ends here at this all out war, where we're just at war. And I'm talking about, at, at, are you ready for this? Some of you are at war with yourself, some of you are at war with God, some of you are at war with other people. And here's the deal I'm going to confront you now. You, <laughs> so don't get mad at me because this is tough, but I believe it's what we need to hear. Because if you're not at peace within your soul, then you're not at peace with God. Really. Because it probably indicates that there are some things in your life that are not submitted to God. And that's not fun to hear, but it's the reality. Because when, I was in the, when the condition of my heart was upset, instead of being the person who prayed for that guy, who cared for that person, who showed compassion in that situation, who humbled themselves in that circumstance, at that moment, there were some things in my life that were not submitted to the authority of God. And so it's a constant act of our will and obedience to do so. So Proverbs says this, Proverbs 17, 14 says, starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam, so drop the matter before all hot war breaks out. Like drop it before it just breaks out. Well, how do we stop the war, pastor? I don't, okay, how do we stop it? Listen, sometimes, oftentimes, you can't stop the war on the outside, but you can stop the war inside. So write it down this way. Write it down. You need to, you need to stop the progression and pursue peace. Write it down in your notes, because if you're not pursuing peace, conflict will pursue you. If you're not actively pursuing peace, I promise you, conflict will seek you out. It will find you. It will get attached to your heart. So what do we do? How do we settle the war within? And listen closely to me, church. This is what Jesus came 
to do. This is the gift he has to offer you. This was his whole mission on earth was to give you this peace. And I'm praying today that you walk out of here different, free, with the power of peace ready for your breakthrough, postured in your heart to attract the right things into your life and see breakthrough happen. Can I get an amen? amen. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. It says, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, without hope and without God in the world. Key, key phrase right here, check it out. It says, but now. You might want to underline, but now. In other words, when Jesus comes into your life, things ought to be different. There ought to be a but now, okay? Because here, listen, if you, if you kind of got sped up with your sin and you, you, you had a moment where you said, Jesus, I need you come into my life, but then your life never changed, you probably didn't receive Jesus. Because when you receive Jesus, there's a but now. There's, there's a but now. There's, there's a difference that Jesus made. Listen, Christianity is not a club. This ain't a club, you guys. This is, this is not a social gathering. This is not a, um, Christianity is not a belief system. This is a place where people have touched the creator of the universe and been set free from their sin. Who have actually, and, when, and when you know him like that, there will be a but now in your life. There will be a change that is produced in your life when you meet him. And he says, but now, when Christ, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace. Like he is peace. In other words, when you meet God, you meet peace. Who has, look what he's done. He not only brings peace between you and him, but he, he says he makes everything that is two, one. See, Paul is trying to settle in this book of Ephesians the war between the Gentiles and the Jews. And he's saying, look, in Jesus, there should be no fighting between you. In Jesus, there should be no quarreling. There should be no contention. He makes the two, one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Now, that's available for you today. That is yours. It's what Jesus came to do to give you. Now, you say, okay, how? That sounds good, but how, Jason? Let me give you three truths that I guarantee you guys will, that will, it'll, it'll produce results. But let me just tell you, none of these are easy. It's not. It's not easy to, to live at peace, to, to walk in the power of peace when you live in a world that hates peace, when you work for a job that could, could care less about peace, but more about money, when you, you know, are in your family or whatever. It's so hard to be, to walk in the power of peace in this world. But I'm telling you, if you do, if you do, it will produce results. You will see breakthrough happen in your life. If you can learn how to walk in the power of peace, you will start to attract the right things into your life. You will start to attract order instead of disorder. Instead of acts of evil, you will attract righteousness and truth and favor and blessing and breakthrough into your life if you walk in the power of peace. I mean, you're ready for that, amen? Let me give you three truths. Okay, three truths to pursue peace today. Number one, here it is. You won't find peace until you make peace. You won't find peace until you make peace. Now, you can't have peace and not make peace with somebody else. Okay, but if you make peace, you will always find peace. I want you to notice it says make peace, meaning we're not just going to go out there and just try to get along and be nicer and try harder. No, you're not going to always get along with people. That's just, it's just the truth. You're not going to always get along. It's not going to happen. But instead, we're going to settle in our hearts the issues we have with other people. And the result is going to be when that's settled, something inside of me settles. Like there's a peace that happens in my life. And then when you do that, you're going to realize, you're going to realize that your battles aren't really against people anyway. They're against principalities. And you begin to experience peace because you cannot have peace if you refuse to settle your issues with other people. You can't. You, can't you, you cannot have the peace of God and, and, and not settle your issues and not make peace with others. And that's, what, that's why some of you aren't walking in the power of peace is because you think those are separate. You think you can have peace with God and have a great relationship with God, yet hate your brothers and your sisters. 
And that's why you're attracting disorder and chaos into your life. And you're not walking in breakthrough. It's because the two are connected. Am I coming at you too hard today? You have to make peace. Let me show it to you in scripture. Picking right up there in James chapter three. It says, but the wisdom that comes from God, in other words, God's way of handling this is, he says, first of all, it's pure. In other words, it all begins with God making you pure. And then there's a semicolon. Okay, first God makes you pure. And that's what happens at salvation. By the way, you're, you are purified from all unrighteousness. That's Jesus has come into your life. The first result is, first of all, pure semicolon. Then here's the list of what happens to those who are saved, who are pure. Peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Then it says this, this powerful line. It says, peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. In other words, the result of peacemaking is things are made right inside of me. Man, are you guys, let me preach over here. Are you guys hearing me today? Listen, when, when, when you actually make peace, when you, when you are making peace, the result is righteousness. A rightness inside of you is made. There is something happens inside of your heart and in your life when you make peace peace. And by the way, the opposite is also true. When you bring God's righteous standard into something, it'll always produce peace. It will. So, so let me say it this way. If, you, um, if your marriage is lacking peace, bring God's righteous standard in the middle of your marriage and you'll have peace. In any of your relationships, actually, if there's any of your relationships that are lacking in peace, bring God's, like your coworkers at, at your job, in your, in your field of work. If it's lacking peace in that area, bring God's righteous standard at your place of work, and you'll have peace. You're going to have peace in your finances, maybe? Okay, your finance kind of chaotic, kind of all over the place. Bring God's righteous standard right in the middle of your finances, and you will have peace. These two are very connected. Peacemaking produces righteousness, and righteousness produces peacemaking. They are connected. That's why Matthew 5, Jesus says this. Blessed are the peacemakers. And there's two Greek words in your New Testament translates to English as blessed. One is eugaloil, and that, is, that means materially blessed. And that's not what Jesus said here. He used the second word, which is makarios. And makarios, get ready for this. You know what makarios means? It means happy happy. And not the happy of like your, your circumstances change. And, and no, it's, it's like this internal joy that no matter what happens around us or outside of us, I still can have joy. Now read it, read it that way. Read it. So happy, regardless of what's going on around you, for those who make peace, for they will be called sons of God. They are the ones who truly understand the mission of Jesus and what it's really about. So here's my point. You want peace? You want it? You want this peace? Make peace. You got to make it. You got to go make, be a peacemaker. Go and settle the issues once and for all, which the question then rises, how do you do that? Like, okay, I'm good with that. I want peace. I want to make peace. How? Let me give it to you. Here's number two. You make peace through this word, Reconciliation reconciliation. You know what that word reconcile means? It's a banking or a finance term. Have you ever reconciled your bank account? When you reconcile your bank account, you bring the balance. It means you bring the balance to zero. That's what it means. You see, what I'm not saying is, and, and what you want me to say is, help me resolve the conflict. Can I get this thing resolved? And I get that. There's a place for that. There's a biblical precedence for conflict resolution, but I can't guarantee your peace with that. See, when we want conflict to resolve, resolve means I'm going to sit, let's sit down together. I'm going to sit down with you. I talk, you talk. Let's, uh, let's talk about what I did right, what you did right, what I did wrong, what you did wrong, and let's learn from that and go do better. Let's go do better. That's what conflict resolution, and there's a time and place for that, but reconciling is something totally different. Reconciling says take that person that you're mad at, that you're frustrated at, that you're, that you're holding an offense that's got you bitter, that's got you contentious, that, that you're quarreling with, take that person and bring their balance to zero. Like, like, don't even get their opinion about it at all. Just bring their balance to zero. Some of you are thinking, I know right now, like, 
Pastor, you're talking crazy. Okay, this is just ridiculous. What are you talking? This is gibberish. How can you? That's why 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says that love keeps no record of wrongs. Why? Because it's reconciled. It's done. It's, it's paid for. It's, check it out. I'm, I'm telling you guys, if you want peace, you need to make peace. If you want to make peace, you need to bring the balance to zero. Thank God that, that, that he did not resolve our conflict, but he reconciled it. Aren't you thankful for that? Thank God that he didn't resolve, didn't he, he didn't resolve our conflict with him, that he didn't set us down and go, listen, you big knucklehead sinner, you. Come on, let's have a conversation. This is what you're doing wrong. This is what you're doing right. Now go and do better. Go and be better. Go and learn from that and earn it. Be better. Thank God, because none of us could have measured up. We were reconciled with God through Jesus, that he brought the balance to zero. And check it out, no matter what you did this week, you could show up in heaven and your debt would be paid. Your balance would still be zero. And I'm not saying, I'm not giving any license to sin or anything like that. I'm talking about grace, that Jesus has paid your debt. He reconciled it. He brought it to zero. Your past, your present, your future debts, you could show up in heaven at any time in Christ with your debts completely paid with a zero balance, free. Thank God that God treated us this way. And then he says, you need to go do the same. Look at this, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. It says, all this is from God. Man, thank God for all this, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us, look at this, the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, here's what he's saying. God is saying, hey, if I did it for you, you need to go do it for others. And you need to know this about God. God has a hard time. He kind of, he has a difficult time with people who like to receive zero balances, but don't like to give zero balances. He's got a particularly like like tough time with those people. In one point, Jesus actually said, don't even come to church. Don't even come to church and bring your gift before the altar. Go reconcile first and then come bring your gift. In one instance, someone asked Jesus, you know, what's the most important commandment? What's the most important commandment, Jesus? Jesus said, I can't give you just one. I, I, I got to give you two. They're connected. He said, fall in love with God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second one is like it, though. I got to give it to you. Love your neighbor as yourself. These two are connected. They're, 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 you cannot have one without the other. You can't, you can't have a right, peaceful standing with God and contention and quarreling with people. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't. And that is why, listen, that is why some of you are not experiencing a lifestyle breakthrough, but you're attracting into your life disorder because you're harboring. You're not letting go. Things are attaching themselves to your heart. You're bitter. You're hostile. You're unforgiving. You're not bringing the balance to zero, and it's attaching itself to your heart. And what that is doing is attracting the wrong things into your life, the wrong people, the wrong habits into your life. It says that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Then he describes it, not counting men's sins against them. Thank God. Amen. Come on. Thank you, Jesus, for not counting my sins against me. But then he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So then he looks at us and he says, go be God's ambassadors. Go, go, go bring zero balances wherever you go. Like, that's what I want you to do. I gave you a zero balance. Now I'm giving you this ministry to be my ambassador that wherever you go, you just erase sin, erase debt. Just go and bring zero balances wherever you go. You want peace? I'm not saying there's a time and place to resolve the conflict. There is. I'm not talking about resolving the conflict, though. I'm talking about your soul being at rest. I'm talking about walking in the power of God's peace. And there's going to be a time for conflict resolution. There sure is. And I would say on that note, um, take the opportunity as, as soon as God gives you the opportunity to resolve it, take that opportunity. There's a biblical precedence for that. But what I'm saying here today is before you ever can resolve it, make sure first you reconcile it. You, rec- you bring it to zero. See what the problem is? Sometimes you guys go into conflict resolution and, and you haven't reconciled it and they don't have a zero balance and what you're doing is try- you're, trying to re- you're trying to get vengeance and repay and you're trying to, so you're dumping on them and, and that's why your conflicts never get resolved is because it's still attached to your heart and you haven't brought a zero balance. Are you guys hearing me today? 
You want peace, you got to make peace. And you make peace by reconciliation, bringing the balance to zero. Please look at me. Please, up here, look at me. Let it go. You need, you need to let it go. I'm not saying it didn't hurt. I'm not saying it wasn't bad. I'm not saying it wasn't wrong. What I am saying, though, is that in order for you to see breakthrough happen in your life, in order for you to start attracting like the right things into your life, the right people even into your life, you have stop harboring that bitterness. It's, get, it's attaching itself to your heart. You have to let it go. Be free. Bring a zero balance. You say, Jason, I can't grab that. I, I can't understand that. You probably never will until you receive it yourself. Here, that's point number three. You probably will never even be able to do what I'm telling you unless you could do number three, which is you can't reconcile until you've been reconciled. You cannot give what you don't have. See, this is an impossible task for you if you haven't yet received your zero balance and you're out here trying to fulfill this requirement to go just let other people off the hook and bring zero balances before. You can't do that in your own power. You can't. It's only when you've been reconciled And see, some of you have already been, like you've been reconciled, like God has brought your balance to zero, but you haven't forgiven yourself. You're not at peace with yourself. And so that's kind of attached to your heart. And so that's why you're not at peace with other people is because they need to suffer because you have to suffer. Why should they be free and I let them off the hook when I haven't even left myself off the hook? I'm preaching a lot better than everyone's responding. (laughs) Romans 5.10 While we were God's enemies, here's a good example, like God shows us something here. Did you know you can have enemies and still have peace? You know you can still have conflict and still have peace. There can still be war and you can still have peace. Like in the middle of it, you can. That's why Psalm 23, David says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. He says, God, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, like, I mean, you're not going to remove all my enemies. You're not going to make all this, everything go away, the trouble and the trial go away. No, no, no. But God, you're going you're gonna to provide for me in the middle of that. You're going to give me peace in the middle of that, strength and provision in the middle of that. There's peace. While we were yet God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. He didn't wait for you to not be an enemy anymore. He didn't wait for you to finally figure it out. Jesus died for you before you ever decided to serve him while you were an enemy. And that's what the ministry of reconciliation is. You may have enemies. You may have people that never get along with you. I still hate you. I hate peace. But that doesn't mean that you have to let that sit on your heart. You can be reconciled. You can reconcile them if you yourself are reconciled. Let me give you one final scripture here in Isaiah 9, 6. It's, it's usually a Christmas scripture, but it's very appropriate for today. You've probably heard this if you've been around church for longer than a year. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Say these last three words out loud together with me. Here we go. Prince of Peace. Say it again. Prince of Peace. Come on, say it one more time. Prince of Peace. He is peace. He is the embodiment of peace. That word Prince of Peace is Sar Shalom in Hebrew. Sar Shalom. It's not, a, it's not a very good translation. I think I have it there in your notes. Sar means the one in charge. He's the one in charge of Shalom. Shalom means rest or tranquility, wholeness, completeness, contentment. See, Jesus is the one in charge of the peace you need. He is not only the embodiment of it, he is in charge of it. And here's what I want to do. We always end like these breakthrough messages with one encounter time, one more time for us to seek God and for us to specifically seek God in this area to see breakthrough in and receive the power of peace. And here's my challenge to you, that you would come to the one who owns peace. Come to the one who is peace. There are some of you here today, and you're seeking for it in the wrong places. Some of you are trying to get fulfillment and peace through your career, through finances, through relationships, and maybe some of you even through drugs or alcohol, or you're you're just, you're, you're, 
there's a story in the Bible in, in John chapter 4, and, then, and we're going to worship God in a moment. And I don't want you to just get, don't get stirring just yet. Don't miss out on your breakthrough here. Stick with me in this last song and really seek God for, for a breakthrough in this area of receiving the power of peace. In John chapter 4, you remember the story, the woman at the well, where Jesus was sitting at the well. The woman comes up to draw water, and Jesus to ask this woman who's a Samaritan for a drink. Can you get me a drink of water? And she's shocked. She's surprised because a Jew is not even supposed to talk to a Samaritan, let alone a, a woman. But this woman, her life was in disarray. It was in disorder and evil practices and habits. Jesus kind of prophesied and said, yeah, you're, 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 the man you're with isn't even your husband. You got five. You're, you're, you got five different men. You're, you're looking for peace in all the wrong places. But Jesus says this in John chapter four. He said, if you would have known, if you knew the gift of God that asks you for a drink, you would ask me and I would give you living water and you would thirst no more. I, I have what you need. I am in charge of what you're looking for. You're looking in the wrong places. If you were to just ask me, I'd give you water and you would, you'd never thirst again. So here's my challenge to you. In this time, right now, I want you to pursue peace. I want you to pursue the person of peace. I want you to pursue the one in charge of peace. I want you to come thirsty to the well that never runs dry. Come, will you stand with me today, guys? Come on. He's in charge of the peace you need. Here's, here's, here's my encouragement to you. Come drink. Come drink. Come drink.